We say good morning to everybody on this beautiful fall, Lord's Day morning. Welcome to all of you. It is so good to see our brothers and sisters. We're glad to be together, and we thank you for your presence. We welcome those of you who are with us by live stream today. We thank you for joining us at this particular time as well. And we say hello to all of our friends from other places, whether you're a guest here this morning or whether you're with us by live stream also. Uh, our, Our goal is, our hope is, that our services today will be such that we'll praise and honor our Heavenly Father, we'll remember and Uh, give ourselves to the Christ that will submit to the Spirit and what the Spirit has made known of the Father's will for all of us and that the fruit of the Spirit will be apparent among us that we'll edify each other, build each other up and that any guest who's with us will have the impression that the Lord is among us today. Is with us today. This morning in our services, uh, Brother John Hewlett will lead us in our prayer in a few moments. Eddie Sanders will lead our hearts as we remember the Lord in the Lord's Supper today. If you haven't remembered to pick up your packet for that, to be sure to remember to go by and do that. Uh, Carrie Cole is leading our singing this morning. And uh, John Ewing will have some announcements for our congregation and then our prayer a little bit later. We have a great theme today. I hope it will be encouraging to each one. We begin with this from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Look into the... Look into thee from day to day, trusting thy grace along the way, knowing that thou will safely keep all is thine. Serve thy soul's redeeming love, serve thy crown of life above, singing this praise that press along, Savior divine. Look into thee, Trusting thy grace, I am as happy as a true soldier can be. Nearing my own heavenly place, trusting thy love, I press along, looking to thee. Looking to thee for all I need, finding in thee a friend indeed. All of the burdens of the day meekly I bear. Neither the foe nor storm I fear, Savior divine, for thou art near. <laughs> Freely to share, looking to thee, trusting thy grace. I am as happy as a true soldier can be. Trusting on oh, heavenly place. Trust in thy love that press along, looking to thee. After a while in heaven bright, where there is neither sin nor night, I shall be holy face to face, Jesus my own. Then with the love one's gone before, I rapture more and more. Praise thee forever near the bright, beautiful throne. Looking to thee. Trusting thy grace, I am as happy as a true soldier can be, nearing my own heavenly place, 
trusting thy love, I press so long, looking to thee. Before we have our opening prayer, let's sing number 141. 141, Father of Mercies. Father of mercy, day by day, my love to thee grows more and more. Thy gifts are strewn upon my way, like sands upon the great seashore, like sands upon the great seashore. Father of mercies, God of love, whose gentle gifts all creatures share, the rolling seasons as they move, proclaim to all thy constant care, Proclaim to all thy constant care. Father of mercy, may our hearts ne'er overlook thy bounteous care, but what our Father's hand imparts still own in grace. Prayer still own in grateful praise and care. Our Father in heaven, we're we're so blessed, we're so grateful to be able to call you Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we're, we're so thankful for your creating us, for your loving us, for your, your giving us this earth, this, this beautiful creation around us, uh, the seasons, uh, the beauty that is, is the change of the seasons. Father, we're, we're mindful of, of your plan for us. We see the seasons and we think of of rebirth and heavenly father we're, we're so thankful for for the grand plan for us we're thankful for uh, that you loved us so much you cared for us so much uh, you valued us so much that you you sent your son to take our place to redeem us so we could be with you father we we have a number of our congregation and our loved ones that need you. Uh, we pray for, for all those in, in our congregation and, and our loved ones that, that need medical help. Heavenly Father, I ask that you be with them, strengthen them, be with uh, the ones in the medical field that care, to, care for them. And, and we ask that you uh, be with the ones of our number who have, who have lost loved ones and, and comfort them. Help us to be a comfort and, and help us to minister unto everyone. Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us to remember that, that you sent us to do your work. Uh, we're here to love our neighbors. Heavenly Father, be with our country, be with the world, be with, uh, be with us as we elect another leader. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, help us to uh, remember you in all that we do. Help us to uh, live for you, live uh, lives that show you, and help us to bring others to Christ. We're thank so thankful once again for, for him, thankful for his perfect life and his love for us and his sacrifice. It's his name we pray. Amen.
Love divine. Sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Love divine, all love excelling, joy of him to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded, thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Come, Almighty, to deliver, let us all thy life receive. Suddenly and, and never, never more thy temples leave. Would thou be always blessing, serve thee as thy host above. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave. Finish thy new creation, pure unspotted may we be. Let us see our whole salvation, please secure, change from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love and praise. Number 193, if it's convenient for you, please be standing for the song. Yeah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mine. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain, whence a healing water. Let the fiery, cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, be thou still my strength. She, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and she. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. Bear me through the swelling current, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praise I will ever give to thee. Songs of praises I will ever give to thee. Be seated, please. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, John, for the prayer in which you've led us. You know, one of the highest privileges of life is to be granted into someone else's heart, to be able to, to know someone else's heart, to be able to have some sense of what another person has been through, what a person 
aspires for or aims for in life, what a person is anxious about in life, to be able to have some understanding of what a person has endured and what a person has accomplished, uh, how a person has felt about all of that, and then what a person has leaned on or drawn from in order to be able to survive and to prosper in all the different experience of a life. We're granted that high privilege uh, with regard to a great and godly man when we read 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is Paul's most personal letter. It has the long sections in it about all of the ups and downs, highs and lows, all the sufferings, all the things that he has, uh, uh, has been used to do by the Lord and how he felt about it. What made him, what made him, uh, as he says in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 5, what made him feel like there were afflictions on all sides, on every side, as he says it. There are fightings or conflicts on the outside, and there are fears on the inside, he says. And he's very open about the things that others are doing around him that are making him anxious for people that he loves and cares about. He's almost embarrassed to have to list all of the things that he personally has been through, and he expresses very openly and it, in, a, in a kind of a vulnerable way, um, how he has felt as he has seen some of those things go on. In the middle of all of it, the great lesson of Second Corinthians, to me at least, is that this man has seen God's hand in all of these circumstances of his life, that he's been able to not only to bear with things, but also to grow and to find delight and to be renewed and to enjoy the opportunities that God gave him. In reading Second Corinthians this time, I have been drawn to the passages in this letter where Paul says something about the God who does this or that. What I've come away with it is a reminder that for all of the, the Lord's children, there needs to be the, the respect for and the understanding of the fact that God is still active, that He's still involved in our lives, that He does things in our lives while we're trying to live for Him. I think that we need to be reminded that a Christian life is not just about what other people are doing around us or what's going on in the world around us. It's not just about what we try to do or how we feel as we're trying to survive from day to day, but that we have a Father who remains a participant in our lives and who does things in our lives from day to day. I thought it might be helpful to me and to you if we read the verses in 2 Corinthians where Paul speaks of the God who does these things. So this will be a simple study, but I think an important one. And if you have a Bible, you have access to your Bible right now on your phone or otherwise, turn to 2 Corinthians with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, let's start. I want to reintroduce us to the God who. And uh, I'm reading these verses today from the New American Standard Version uh, just because I wanted to this morning. Let's start with the God who comforts us in all our afflictions, in all of our troubles, in all of the things that put pressure on us, and all the things that squeeze us, which is what the word for afflictions mean. Verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our, all our affliction, 
so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I counted verses 3 through 7, and if I count it right, there are, Paul uses the word comfort nine different times in these few verses. I, I get the message. That's what he wants to call our attention to. The word for comfort that he uses is telling us what happens because God is merciful. All mercy originates in Him and His character. It's His kindness, His compassion, His generosity. And because of His mercies, God comforts us in all our affliction. Comfort means that God comes to our side. That He comes to our to stand beside us, that He puts His arm around us. That's the meaning of the word. The word comfort in some forms is translated exhort. In other forms, it's translated console or encourage. God comes to our aid to console and encourage us. We may not always realize that He's there. This is talking about what God does and not how we feel at a moment when we are in affliction. It's the reassurance that this is the way the Father of mercies deals with His children. Like you would come to their, your little ones when they're hurting or struggling, God does that with us. I read again, I ran across again just in the last few days, uh, something that uh, Joe Barnett had written, reminding us of the story of Jackie Robinson. You remember that Robinson was the first African American to play Major League Baseball in the in the modern era. Uh, I didn't know until I read this that there was another man who played Major League Baseball in uh, in 1883 whose name was Moses Fleet Walker, who was, who was actually the first. But Jackie Robinson in the modern era. Robinson broke the color bar barrier at great cost to himself in many ways. Uh, he, 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 he's lauded today. His numbers retired in every ballpark. But back then, in 1947, when he was signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers, um, wasn't necessarily that way. When he jogged onto a field or came to bat in some opposing ballpark, the sneers and the jeers could sometimes be deafening. He preferred to play at home for that reason. In Brooklyn's Ebbets Field, where the Dodgers were at the time, and where there weren't any racial taunts, until one day in one game, he misjudged uh, a grounder and made an error. And then the trickle of booze swelled to a roar in his home ballpark as well. And Jackie Robinson stood at second base with his hat, head bowed, humiliated and alone. And if you're familiar with the story, you know what happened. The shortstop at, uh, of the Dodgers at the time was Pee Wee Reese. Pee Wee Reese walked over to second base, put his arm around Jackie Robinson's shoulder, and looked around at the crowd and glared at them. 25,000 spectators were present that day. And as he did, Ebbets Field became as quiet as a, as a cemetery where, where there were no people. Jackie Robinson later on said that Pee Wee Reese's arm around his shoulder saved his career. I think our Heavenly Father has saved a lot of careers and a lot of lives by comforting us in our affliction. It's important that we realize that that's what Paul says he, he does. It's not past tense. It's what he does still.
Secondly, in 2 Corinthians 1, look down at verses 9 and 10. I might actually start at verse 8. God raises the dead. God who raises the dead rescues us, Paul will say here. Uh, Verse 8, we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction which occurred in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. Now stop and think about that before I read the rest of it. Uh, A lot of what's written about this text tries to guess what the affliction Paul experienced in Asia Minor was. We're not told what it was exactly. It could have been anything. But have you ever felt like your cause was so lost that it was like that, that you had the, you despaired even of life. Paul just knew in his heart that the death sentence was awaiting him for, for whatever reason it was. He felt like he was a dead man. Paul says now though, this happened so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Paul was seeing that God allowed him to experience that moment so that he would learn not to rely on anything else but God. The God who raises the dead, who rescued us from so great a danger of death, and will rescue us. What Paul is saying here is, I was brought to a time when I had to decide whether I depended on myself or something I had or on God. And I've chosen to set my hope on God who raises the dead. He's the one who rescues us. Now, unspoken here is the fact that Paul is practicing the faith of Abraham. Over in Romans 4 and verses 17 and following, we're reminded that Abraham, even when things were, as, when his body was as good as, as dead, had the promise of God that he would have a son. And that he, his faith in the God who raises the dead did not waver. Again, in Hebrews chapter 11, about verses 17 and following, I think, the Hebrew writer, to encourage us, makes the point that Abraham believed God or acted by faith whenever he was told to take that son and to offer him up in a sacrifice to God, and that Abraham obeyed because he was convinced that God was able to to raise him from the dead, which in a figure he did, didn't he? The God who raises the dead appears at least two or three other times in this letter. In chapter 4 and verse uh, 12, verses 11 and 12, along in there, Paul turns attention in that direction again. In chapter 13 and verse 4, he does it again to say that it's when we are weak, when we know we're weak, and we decide to rely on God who raises the dead, that we're strong. You know, we're in a situation in our country and in our lives right now, it'd be a good time for us to have learned that the only thing that we can actually truly rely on is the God who raises the dead. It'd be a shame if we found ourselves in this experience and that what we took away from it is I was put in a situation where I felt like I, I was under the sentence of death and that I had to rely on something So I chose to rely on my money, or my politics, or my recreation, or myself. It would be a good time for us to choose to rely on the God who rescues, the God who raises the dead. Third, Paul says in chapter 1 and verses 21 and 22, 
Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Now please notice some things about that statement. He who establishes us in Christ with you is God. The word established means, when it's talking about an, a point of truth, it means to, be, to confirm it. It's what God did by signs and wonders and mighty signs, uh, uh, mighty uh, uh, works through either of the apostles or through His Son to confirm the truth of what they taught or what they claimed. When this word is used of persons and of some quality of character in their lives, like solid faith, it can be translated strengthened. God strengthens. Again, we don't always see how He does this, but this is what Paul is saying. God, notice present tense, establishes us with you in Christ. I don't always understand how my body takes energy from the food I eat, but I know it does. I don't always understand how God strengthens me, but I know because this says that He does. Notice also in this reading of these two verses that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all present and active in behalf of God's family. Paul never tries to explain how there can be Father, Son, and Spirit and one God, but he always teaches this. The very last sentence of the book of 2 Corinthians has a beautiful statement of this in it. In this case, though, it's God who establishes us, God the Father. He establishes us and and commissions us, which is what the anoint means. He does it in Christ, who is His Son, whom He gave up for us. And it, He establishes our faith in Christ and strengthens us in it. And then He seals us, that is, puts His, His stamp on us as belonging to Him. And He gives us His Spirit in our hearts as a pledge or a guarantee or as an earnest money or a down payment on the inheritance that's still to come for us. It's a wonderful picture of how deeply God is involved in the lives of His people to help them toward their inheritance. Then fourth, God always leads us in triumph in Christ. This is chapter 2, verse 14. Look at it. Paul has described here some of the anxiety that, and the worry he's been through about these people and, and, and having had no rest until he's been able to find out how they're doing. And he finally says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us reveals the fragrance of the knowledge of Him in every place. The picture that this comes from is the picture of the Roman habit of, uh, of, what, of how to celebrate a victory, a victory in battle. The, the, the emperor would give for the conquering general a, what to us would amount as a big parade. And uh, along the way would be would be the general coming along and then his soldiers who had won the victory and then there would be people around to, to burn incense, to offer up fragrant incense along the way, the flowers and so forth. And then they'd lead along the captives and the prisoners and all of that that they had, all of the spoil that they had taken in the battle. And here, God is the one who leads His people in triumph this way. He leads a proud, former proud Pharisee like Paul along the way. Now, 
with faith in Christ, whether he has to be treated like a slave or whether he's treated like a, a general who's won a battle, God is leading him along in triumph. And the fragrance that comes from the gospel which he preaches is apparent all along the way. It either smells like the wonderful celebration of victory to those who are being saved, or it smells like the repulsive odor of death to those who reject it. N.T. Wright and Michael Byrd have a book recently published, The New Testament in Its World. And I found their comment about this scene. A servant of Christ's body personifies the story of the suffering of Christ. He's a walking, talking parable of Jesus' death and resurrection, of the fact that the living God uses death, vulnerability, and weakness to bring about life, hope, and triumph. And now listen. To the world, such a life smells of death and defeat but actually, it's spreading an aroma that brings life. To the cultural elites, such people often look pathetic and defeated, but in reality, they're the champions of God's kingdom. To sophisticated professors, their message sounds foolish and dishonorable, but in God's eyes, they embody His wisdom and righteousness. To the political powers, they are the scum of the earth. But in God's design, they're the only ones upon whom the end of the ages has come. Jars of clay concealing the all-encompassing power of God. That, friends, is a fair representation of the message of 2 Corinthians. Number five. Look over at chapter 4 and verse 6. God is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Christ Jesus. This is chapter 4, verse 6. In order to appreciate the statement, I probably should read verse 4 also. And you see the contrast that's here. He's talking about people being able to see what the gospel offers to us. But he says, if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, verse 3, in whose case, verse 4, the God of this world, who's the God of this world? It's Satan. Um, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God so that when light shines, they see only darkness. When knowledge is available, there's, a, there's ignorance instead. Uh, when the way to live is present, there's confusion and darkness instead. Now verse 6, For God, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness. As near as I can tell, that is a reference to Genesis 1 and verse 3. Let there be light. God who said that is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. As you know, in this part of 2 Corinthians, the whole image is, is the illustration is Moses having seen the glory of God, and he comes down from the mountain, and his face is still shining, and the people are afraid of the glory of God, and he has to wear a, a veil, you remember, from Exodus 33, 34? Well, in this case now, it's not just having seen the glory of God, it is the glory of God being present in the person of Christ, and looking on his face and not being afraid of it, but being changed from one image to another like it. That was in one of the songs Carrie led us in a few moments ago, if you noticed. God has shined in our hearts to give the light. And that light, of course, is still affecting us and still changing us and still working on us. That's what Paul teaches about God's involvement. Then next... 
He says, God has prepared us for this very purpose. Now, we'll need to explain what that purpose is. In chapter 5 now, in verses 4 and 5, you'll see verse 5 is the one where this phrase comes from. Now, he prepared, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God. What purpose is that? What are these things for which he's prepared us? Well, verse 4. For indeed, we who are in this tent groan, being burdened. Now, this tent is this physical body. For the truth of this, did any of you groan when you got up this morning? I groaned when I got up from the breakfast table. I groaned when Carrie said, if it's convenient for you, will you please be standing? More importantly, we groan with regard to our own mortality. We wish we wouldn't get sick. We wish we wouldn't age. We wish we wouldn't lose people we love. We wish relationships wouldn't be broken. We groan. That's what Paul's talking about. He says, being burdened because... We do not want to be unclothed. We don't want to be without a body. We want to be clothed. We want to have a house to live in. So that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God. What purpose? For being swallowed up by life. I love that image. Kay and I were reading it last night, and she said, what does it mean to be swallowed up by life? We know what it means to be swallowed up by death. What does it mean to be swallowed up by life? Isn't that a wonderful thought? It means that God has prepared us to want to be clothed with a body which is immortal and which is fit for His presence. How he does this is with all the experiences of life. But most notably, look down to chapter 5 and verse 18, where it says, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He reconciled us, verse 19, by not counting our wrongdoings against us. He's able to not not count our wrongdoings against us because He offered Christ on our behalf. Verse 21, we studied this recently. Justin taught us a lesson about this. Uh, God has reconciled us to Himself. He has an inheritance for us. And verse 5 again says, For this very purpose, He gave us His Spirit as a pledge as the first installment on our inheritance. The Spirit who brings forth love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control in our lives. That's a down payment on our inheritance. And then number seven, uh, I don't know how you like seven points in a study, but remember, I didn't write Second Corinthians. I'm only reading it. Verse 7, or number 7 here, God is the one who comforts the discouraged. Notice we've come full circle from comforting us in our afflictions to comforting us. The, big, the real word should be probably, as ESV has it, the downcast, the humiliated, the lowly. Uh, when when Paul describes now, he, he kind of goes back to where he was at chapter 2, verse 13, when he gets to chapter 7 and verses 5 and 6. And at verse 6 of chapter 7, he says, But God, who comforts the discouraged, comforted us by the arrival of Titus. Titus had been to Corinth, And he brought message back to Paul, not only by his arrival, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted among you as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, 
your zeal for me, that's over the wrongs that had been done, so that I rejoiced even more. In chapter 8, verse 16, Paul thanks God for having put earnest care into the heart of Titus. So what we're saying is God comforts the discouraged by putting earnest care into the hearts of persons and putting those persons in our lives. If we could see each other as being God, the people that God put His care in hearts in order for us to be present in each other's lives, I think it would be helpful to us. So think about all of this picture together now. God who? God who comforts us, who rescues us from the dead, who establishes us, who leads us, who gives us light, who prepares us for life, who comforts us, the discouraged, the downcast. That God is blessed forever. Chapter 11, verse 31 says... That's the message for, from our hearts to him today. He's blessed forever. Paul uses it almost as if an oath of his own truthfulness, his, own, his confession that this God knows him, knows whether he's telling the truth or lying. He wants to be grateful to this God. He wants to be sure that this God is always present, always welcome in his life. He wants to say to all of us, at the low points for me, at the hard times, I have believed that this God was present and involved and at work in my life and experience. And that's my goal today, to have learned for this for myself. This God is working to do these things in me. And that's what I want you to what I want to say to you, I want you to know that God wants you to let Him work on you and in your life in these same way too, in these same ways too. I hope you understand Him that way today. I hope you see that what He's offering in Christ is to do these things in our experience. When the gospel is preached and all of us are, are called to Christ, that's what's being offered to us. So how about it? Have you confessed the name of Christ? Have you been united with His work by being baptized into Him? Are you walking with the Father in the steps of Christ each day. There's no reason why you can't be if that's what you will choose. We hope this morning that if that need is present in your life, that you'll you'll let us know that you wanna you wanna you want this God to be involved. For this first song we're gonna offer everyone the opportunity to uh, respond to that invitation with the second song then we'll prepare to observe the Lord's Supper together this Lord's Day morning would you please be standing while we sing come no change my heart shall fear and safe is such confiding for nothing changes here. The storm may roar without me, my heart may low be laid, but God is round about me, and I can be dismayed. Wherever He may guide me, no one shall turn. <clears throat> My shepherd is beside me, and nothing can I lack. His wisdom ever waketh. His <clears throat> 
He knows the way he taketh, and I will walk with him. Green pastures are before, yet I have not seen. Bright skies will soon be o'er me, where the dark clouds have been. My hope I cannot measure, my path to life is free. My Savior has my treasure, and He will walk with me. Be seated, please. Before we observe the Lord's Supper, sing verses 1, 2, and 3 of In the Hour of Trial. In the hour of trial, Jesus plead for me, lest by base denial I depart from thee. When thou seest me waver with a look recall, nor fall. Suffer me to fall with forbidden pleasures, this vain world charm, or its sordid treasure spread to work me harm. Bring to my remembrance sad Gethsemane, or in darker semblance cross crown Calvary. Should thy mercy sin, sorrow to. <clears throat> Or should pain attend me on my path below? Grant that I may never fail thy hand to see. Grant that I may ever cast my care on thee. Holy Father, as we come to this portion of our worship this morning, we are thankful that you are a giving God. We are thankful that you are God who brings to us all the things that we do not deserve, that you and Jesus saw to it that through the redemption we can be sons and daughters in your kingdom. Father, as we remember, we ask that you would bless this red representing the body of Christ that he gave for us. And as we partake, Father, bless this bread. Bless each of us that partake. We pray this in Jesus' name. And amen.
Holy Father, as we continue to remember the blood that Jesus shed for us that would redeem us back to you, we ask, Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents that blood, that you bless this fruit of the vine, that you bless us as we partake, and as we remember that sacrifice, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we've heard this morning, God is a God who, and my first thought was, is a giver. And as uh, we consider those things that God has given us, we are to be as close to Christ and as God as we can get. We should be givers also. So we can give of our time, we can give of our talents, we can give of our money. At this time, we will have a prayer for the giving of our money, but you, every day, can be, be a giver of your time and your talent. Uh, there's baskets at the doors as you enter or leave for your contributions. Holy Father, as we come to this portion of our worship, also giving, giving back to you, we can never give the amount that you've given to us. Bless, Father, the gift and the giver. We pray this in Jesus' name, and amen. Sing verses 1 and 2 of Do All in the Name of the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do not in name of man or creed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name. Do all in the name of the Lord, in word or deed, as God decreed. Do all in the name of the Lord. Be not deceived by worldly greed. Do all in the name of the Lord. The Spirit says, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in His name. Do all in the name of the Lord, in word or deed, as God decreed. Do all in the name of the Lord. Good morning. Thanks so much, Bill, for that lesson. Thanks to Carrie and John and Eddie for also leading us and for all those behind the scenes and helping make the live stream possible. And thanks especially to each of you this morning for being here with us. It's so, so encouraging to see each one of you. It's also so encouraging to know there are so many live streaming with us this morning as well. And we miss you all. Those that are not able to be with us, and we look forward to 
our time to be together again. A couple of announcements uh, regarding our classes. Uh, thanks to Justin for the survey he sent out this past week. If you have not had the time yet uh, to participate in filling that out, please do that today or tomorrow as we'd like to have that available uh, as the elders meet this coming Tuesday uh, to look at that uh, as we move forward uh, in our plans for our in-person classes. Also, October's uh, YFC and youth event will be a trunk or treat at the Thrashers on the 25th at 5. Uh, we plan to have chili and a hayride as well. Anyone who would like to provide a trunk is welcome to join us. Kids can come in costume and set up for trunks will begin at 4.30. Please let Cambry or Chelsea know if you plan to come. A couple of updates to our prayer list. Um, we mourn with Linda Currier and her family as her brother Joe Burney passed away. Uh, Saturday, yesterday, uh, there will be a private family service. Thank you for all your prayers and concern, uh, Linda says. And then Nancy Snyder's brother James was in a coma from COVID but is now stable. So continue to remember Linda Currier and her family and her, passing her brother Joe and, and Nancy Snyder's uh, brother James. Uh, also, we had Justin and Carolyn and Ruth all recovering from surgery this past week. So remember uh, them and their recovery, uh, as well as uh, those others listed uh, on the prayer list. Thanks to Cindy for helping Johnny out and get that bulletin out this past Friday. Would you all please be standing for our closing prayer. Let's go out this week and give the light. Uh, as Bill mentioned in our lesson from 2 Corinthians, and also realize the care that God has placed in our hearts to, to help others uh, this week. I'd like for our prayer this morning to be the prayer that Bill has written on the bulletin. And that will be our closing for this morning. Let's all bow our heads together as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to your throne in behalf of all people. These are troubled and confusing times. Choices are being made. Let your mercies be upon our country and grant us grace to help in the time of our need. We pray for all who are in high positions or who may ever be appointed to them. May they exercise whatever authority you give them only in the interest of righteousness and the pursuit of justice. May their service make it harder to do evil and easier to do right. We ask that it be so for the sake of your people, especially. Let conditions be such that your people may lead peaceful and quiet lives. May your people be able to practice godliness and to live with dignity. Help us act as free people, honoring everyone, loving each other, and fearing you alone. Help us to hold on to the word of life and to hold it forth for everyone at all times. We request that it be this way for the sake of all other people, too. We give thanks for our neighbors and fellow citizens. We pray that the circumstances in our country and that the presence of your people in it will allow all of them to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We know that is what you want, and we ask that your will may be done. We offer you our thanksgiving for being so great and so good. We are grateful that you, by your own gracious will, sent your son in our form and that he has given himself as a ransom for all and that he is our mediator at your right hand it is in his beloved name that we raise our prayer make these requests and ask you to hear us amen <laughs>